Welcome to Everything Co-op, bringing you information on how cooperatives can help improve your quality of life. This show is being sponsored by the National Co-op Bank, NCB. The NCB is dedicated to strengthening communities nationwide for the delivery of banking and financial services for the nation's cooperatives, their members, and other socially responsible organizations. For more information on the power of community ownership, visit ncb.coop. That's ncb.coop. Now stay tuned for your host, Vernon Oaks. Welcome, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks. Welcome to Everything Cooperative. This is a beautiful, beautiful Thursday morning. The sun's up. I'm up. And Martin Lowry is up and in the studio with us today. I Good am, morning, Vernon. Martin. Good morning. How are you? I'm excellent. How are you doing? Good. On a hot, humid day here in Washington, D.C. Oh, but I love it. I love it. Listen, Martin, you have been the, I forgot your title with National Rural Electric Cooperative, but you're retired now. From I, here. I'm retired. The title was Executive Vice President for Member and Association Relations, uh, and now it's Executive Vice President Emeritus. Emeritus. All yes. right. So retired uh, May a year ago. Fantastic. You look too young to be retired. Okay. Thank you for that. And you're on the board of the National Co-op Bank? Uh, I am. I'm the uh, immediate past chair. I was chair for two years and very proud of that. Um, love the National Cooperative Bank. I think Chuck Snyder as a CEO is doing a fabulous job. I know he's a sponsor of the program, but that's not why I bring it up. Uh, and the bank itself has a great board of directors, great staff, and, and a mission. I mean, the mission driven bank. Mission driven bank. Um, looking at at least 30 to 35% of the lending to be to cooperative and community organizations. Well, Roberta McDonald from Cabot Creamery, and when she was on the show, she said that Chuck Snyder and the folks at NCB are angels with the work that they do. <laughs> okay. They're also very good bankers. <laughs> yeah, okay. And that's a really interesting piece because when I took banking, it was sort of like bankers are interested in one thing, getting their money back, getting their money back, and getting their, what, three things, getting their money back, getting their money back, and getting their money back. And that means that they normally loan to people that have collateral. So that if they mess up in the deal they're in, they would have something to go get their money back. It is interesting how Chuck is an NCB since mid '80s have been making loans to low-income communities. That's Correct. their mission. That's right. That's right. Cooperative members and associations in low-income communities, and doing that. So. Well, I was pleased uh, this past year to uh, have represented the bank and Chuck at uh, a meeting of the Alliance for Banking on Values. It's an organization that's not well known, but it fits right into our conversation. They had their 10th anniversary meeting in Vancouver, British Columbia. And so, for example, Van City uh, Credit Union, which is a very large Canadian credit union, uh, was a sponsor of that program. And Van City is very much a value-based credit union organization. So NCB has been a member for a couple of years now, National Cooperative Bank. Mm -hmm. And uh, to be with a group of bankers who see banking differently was quite an experience. Oh, I would like to see that. It was quite, quite amazing. And and on the collateral issue, they have multiple stories about trust and verification on low income or organizations that are assumed to have a low income stream as well. And uh, yes, you have to do your due diligence. And, and obviously, you have to protect the assets of the organization. But that doesn't mean you can't have flexibility in your lending practices. Mm -hmm. Yes. So it's not an automatic no if you have... Well, let me say it differently. I, as you know, I'm a property manager. That's what I do full time. And I have noticed that the credit report is not a really good indicator of whether somebody will pay their rent or not. Okay. It's, it's really, I'd say it differently. If somebody may have a low credit score, but still pay rent. And that, that's why it's not a good indicator. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of like more like getting into who is the person, what's their values, how long have they worked, getting to other variables. And this is what I would think that the bank has to do, too, or the people with the values is get into other things besides what's the credit score or what is the amount of assets that you have. That, that, that's true, except for the most part, the bank's business is is commercial lending as opposed to individual lending. Right. Um, so, But the same principles apply. Yep. Okay. So you on the NCB board, you're also the representative for the U.S. for International Cooperative Alliance. I am. I am. Okay. 
David Thompson and I looked at doing that one year, <laughs> about 10 years ago. Uh, that seems like that would be, well, I thought it would be awesome to do that, travel around, look at what's going on around the world in, in the cooperative movement. Well, yeah, and let's talk about that a little bit. So first of all, it's an elected position. So I had a run for that position, and I'm, yeah, I'm yeah, very, we were, very yeah. pleased to be, have been successful. Yeah. But we have had continuity in that position, meaning the U.S. board member mm-hmm. to the International Cooperative Alliance, um, Dave Miller of uh, Nationwide was on the board for for years. Dave and I served on the NCBA CLUSA board together. And when Dave retired and stepped down from his elected position on the IC board, International Cooperative Alliance, he gave a very impassioned speech in the NCBA CLUSA boardroom. And that got my attention. Uh, there are a lot of people who simply aren't aware of the ICA. Hmm. So Paul Hazen then, uh, as CEO of NCBA CLUSA, uh, was able to take that seat with the follow-up election, and then I followed Paul. Uh, the organization is 125 years old next year. It, it's pretty stunning. 1895, w- one of the oldest associations in the world. The board uh, 1895. 1895. Survived two world wars, uh, intact, and a, a story that I think may be meaningful to folks in terms of the amazing... Um, resiliency of the organization is that on the 70th anniversary of D-Day, we were at a meeting in Brussels, the board of directors was, and we had dinner that night. And our German elected representative stood up and gave a toast to D-Day, honoring the British, the U.S., the Canadians, and the Australians in their efforts to bring peace back to the world. In fact, we're having an interesting discussion today, I mean, contemporaneously, about the role of cooperatives and world peace, which may seem to be a stretch, but there is a long history of addressing world peace, a long history of um, looking at um, concerns uh, for community health, societal health, as it relates to avoiding conflict and preventing conflict, that then can lead to a more peaceful world. And so if you think of it at that level, at the community level, cooperatives do play a very stabilizing force in jobs creation, community development. And think about that in the context of the Middle East. Think about it in the context of what happened uh, with Serbia and Bosnia and and so on, the the situation in Colombia years ago with the FARC. There is a lot of evidence that cooperatives played a role in the background in in stabilizing those communities to bring things back to a, to economic health. National Co-op Bank has been sponsoring this program for six years. So this October, we will be celebrating six years. And that's this great. is the first time I've heard about world peace, co-ops and world peace. That's a great new I – mean, that's I can see it. I just never thought about it, how co-ops could play a role in – peace around the world. If you just look at this um, cooperation among co-ops, social responsibilities and the values, uh, um, Papa Sin from Senegal. I know him well. He was that first month, October, co-op month. We were only going to do this program for one month, Mm -hmm. (laughs) Martin, and that was October six years ago. And and Papa Sin was on that, and he said that the co-ops are created to solve a community problem. And second to that, he said, if there's no community problem, there's no need for a co-op. Right. So I found that very, very interesting. And I, I get creating jobs. That's, that's one of the things, a, a reason for creating a co-op. I get a, all the different kinds of problems and solutions that co-ops do, whether it's rural electric or broadband or credit unions, financial services. But world peace, I had not thought about it, and I get it. I really get it. It's, in, it's quite interesting. Well, one of the people that uh, was most amazing on the subject is the late Ian McPherson, who was Canadian and a professor at Victoria, University of Victoria. And there are there is a lot of literature out there. Um, anyone who's listening in can Google that and check out uh, McPherson. There are, there are actually books written on the subject. Claudio Sanchez Bajo, who is the Cooperatives of the Americas representative to the Cooperative Research Committee, 
has specialized in this. She's with the University of Buenos Aires. She's been a, um, a professor at um, uh, University of Texas at Austin and so on. Has written quite a bit of material on it. And uh, I'm only beginning to learn about this, I, as, as you are. It's, um, it's something that came up just in the recent past, but there is a, a long history of this, and it's certainly worth exploring further. I'm going to look into it. I like, I even like the idea it fits in corporations among cooperative and concern for community. Absolutely correct. Number the seven. Sixth and seventh principles. Okay. So you were on the board of ICA. <laughs> you were retired from NECA. You were past chair of NCB. You were on the board of NCBA CLUSA. Okay. You're Mr. Cooperative. Well, I do my part, sir. <laughs> I do my part. I, I'm in love with the business model. I am too, and it's it's sad. It's sad to me is I did not hear about this until I started managing housing co-ops, <laughs> and I've just fallen in. Love. I would see just everyday normal people running a business and doing it very well. They didn't go get an MBA somewhere or get to all this education, but they got the training. The fifth principle is uh, training information. Uh, this whole education piece, they got the information they needed to run a business, and they do. And they do it quite well. Mm -hmm. Most housing co-ops are highly successful. Unfortunately, the ones that fail take a lot of energy and time and effort that they fall, but it's either there's some predator in the world somewhere in that mix, right. either inside the co-op or outside the co-op, particularly with gentrification like in D.C. and New York and stuff where people want to come up to properties gotten such a high value. But they, they're they very successful. It works. So to go back to your point about meeting a need, um, you and I attended the Federation of Southern Cooperatives annual meeting a couple of weeks back in Birmingham, and there's always a, a pre-meeting conversation of folks that are interested in just sitting down and you know, getting to know one another again was coming from folks who have been with the Federation for, for years and years and fought the good fight on civil rights and found reasons to create, particularly um, uh, cooperatives for black farmers who had lost their tenant status and, and so on. Many, many of our listeners would know the story. The conclusion, when you, when you take the premise that you've got to have a need or, or there's no point in having a co-op, the conclusion is it doesn't start from the top. It starts from the grassroots. Mm-hmm. You know, any successful cooperative is not going to be put in place by a national association or an international association. It's going to come from the individuals in the community who find a need that is not otherwise being met. And in rural America, broadband is a perfect example of that. Right. And then your organizations up the line in terms of state, regional, and national need to be able to provide the support, technical assistance, and so on, to make sure that the grassroots effort doesn't fail for lack of resources. All right. And we're going to go in our first break here in a minute, but I want to give a shout out now to Anita Bond. She's councilwoman for D.C. She started a limited equity housing co-op task force, and it's all about that creating the technological support for housing co-ops. Uh, there's about 100 limited equity co-ops in the Washington, D.C. area. That's fantastic. And um, at different uh, different spaces. And she's going to be on, I think, uh, October the 10th. And somewhere in co-op month, she's going to be on the show. But she's got it. And she's gotten that co-ops is the answer for gentrification. Uh, for affordable housing in the Washington, D.C. area. So I'm, I'm really liking, it's been hard to get the attention of mm -hmm. council people about this co-op model, but I really like that she's doing that. So I'll give, give her a shout out. Terrific. So we're going to take our break and then we'll come back. I want to talk a little bit more about some of the things that you talked about in Birmingham and then move on to what's happening internationally. We'll be right back. Please don't touch that dial. Washington, D.C.'s News Talk, 1450 AM WOF at 95.9 FM. Welcome back, everybody. Mr. Martin Lowry is our guest this morning, and my name is Vernon Oaks, and the program is Everything Cooperative. We This program is sponsored by the National Cooperative Bank. 
And we're talking about, uh, we're talking about ICA, International Cooperative Alliance. We've been talking about National Rural Electric Cooperatives. They have a lot to talk about. Martin has a breadth of knowledge. He's retired and he has a PhD in philosophy. So the philosophy classes I took were great, but I never thought about majoring in that thing. That, that is wonderful. And do you use that at all in this world of oh, cooperative? I'd, I'd love to go around, uh, Universities talking, philosophizing <laughs> at universities about the importance of the liberal arts. I wasn't sure I would use it, but I have to admit, part of my philosophical training is in logic and foundations of mathematics and systems theory. So that fits right in with technology, computer science. In fact, for my first two years at NRECA, I was the assistant manager of computer services because the work I had done in logic and mathematics made progr- computer programming very easy. Mm-hmm. It was like the equivalent of a computer science degree. But the more important uh, aspect of this, and I think it's one that you would recognize having taken philosophy courses, is your ability to analyze a situation, think, think resynthesize what you found, and reach a new conclusion. Yeah. And so I found that to be tremendously important in my career, that any any issue that would come forward, whether it was an opportunity or a challenge, you can step back, sort of take it apart, rethink it, put it back together, and say, here's a way for us to move forward. And the third thought on this is ethics, ethics and values. And you don't need to take a philosophy course to be very good at thinking and behaving ethically, but struggling through different viewpoints on what ethical behavior is, how it comes about, what its foundation is, can be can be helpful as well. So you're going to go give some talks to the government here, the federal government, on ethics and behavior? Okay, so I like the ethical principles of co-ops, yes. honesty, openness, social responsibility, and caring for one another. I, did, I love these ethical principles. Excellent. That's uh, right. Particularly the one of caring for, for one another. And values, that, that is great. So I, I want to go back to ICA and something that you talked about in Birmingham when you got up to, to talk. You talked about bringing some folks to Birmingham from ICA. There was a meeting or something. Can you tell us about that? Surely. Every eight, ten years, the U.S. has the opportunity to have the board of directors of the ICA in the U.S. Uh, as hosts. Uh, we have 20, 20 members of the board, and then you have translators, you have others. So you have probably 35 to 40 people when you include staff. And so it's a, it's a big commitment. And uh, NCBA Clusa made that commitment. Um, NRECA also made a, made a commitment to, to support uh, the effort. And uh, it all interrelated to the Federation of Southern Cooperatives that we talked about in the last segment, the organization that supports black farmers in the southeast and black farmer cooperatives in the Mm -hmm. southeast. It was our turn to host, and they could have picked anywhere in the country. They could have said, let's see San Francisco or Austin, Texas or Mm -hmm. New York City, Miami. And I suggested – uh, with strong support of the U.S. cooperatives, that they come to Birmingham, Alabama. The reason I made that suggestion is um, on the 49th anniversary of Bloody Sunday, the Pettus Bridge and, in Selma, uh, I had the privilege of being part of a congressional delegation that walked the bridge with John Lewis. We were in the um, Brown AME Church Chapel. Mm-hmm. Before that, hearing uh, Andrew Young, Jesse Jackson, and others it was um, a quite amazing emotional experience because it didn't just include um, walking the bridge at Selma. It included visiting um, Medgar Evers home and having um, his wife come in from California to talk about the horrible evening when Medgar was killed. We went to Fannie Lou Hamer's grave. We learned a lot about the Mississippi Freedom Delegation in the 1964 uh, Democratic Convention. Uh, trying to uh, take those seats and ultimately failing on it. But the bravery of uh, Fannie Lou Hamer uh, was was quite clearly discussed by a lot of folks. And so, and um, the most emotional was being in Money, Mississippi, next to the graveyard or the cemetery where Emmett Till was to be buried after he was so uh, horribly murdered as a 
14 year old, I believe, mm-hmm. um, on a summer trip down to Mississippi where it was claimed that he had whistled at a white girl at the grocery store. We were right there at the church. Grocery store was right there. And I sat next to his cousin who told us all about that evening and how horrible it was. So all of that um, built a great deal of emotion as we came out of the Brown Chapel to an amazing 3,000 people who had come from all around the world to, to walk the bridge on the 49th anniversary. And so I felt that that experience for me was was so life-changing that I would take the chance and see whether people from around the world could could get a sense of what the civil rights movement was really about. So they came, but I would admit that many of them came, maybe not skeptically, but really not knowing what they were going to find. What they were going to get into. So we uh, took them to the new interpretive center between Montgomery and Selma, which is a fabulous place. If if any of you are in that area, don't miss it. Then we came to um, Selma. We um, talked with uh, folks who had been involved with Martin Luther King from the beginning. Some amazing people that uh, Cornelius Blanding, who is now the head of the Federation, was able to to bring forward, um, and um, they were they were quite important to listen to. And um, the thing that really struck me is as we walked the bridge, there were people from all over the world tweeting back to their fellow countrymen, I am now walking the Emmett Pettus Bridge. They knew. They knew at that point what it meant. Since then, I have had nothing but thank yous and compliments from everywhere in the world that they really found themselves to have a better understanding of what the civil rights movement was in the U.S., so I, I get that. I know in in sixty four I was going into high school. I was going into my senior year. I graduated in sixty five. So we were watching this stuff on TV. You know, the little round TV with all of the snow. <laughs> you know, right. Some of the first TVs, and I imagine around the world they were probably watching this stuff with dogs on people and horses and stuff trampling folks down and. Almost dragging people by the hair. It was, it was terrible to see it. And then to get a sense of what people would stand up for when John Lewis got beat. And it's just wonderful. Like it's just, it could have been dead. Just, you know, then that, that people would put themselves in that space for the right to vote, for the right to be an American citizen, full citizen. And I'd imagine all around the world, people, respect that and want it themselves for those areas that don't have that I think I think you're correct except for the fact that it's easily forgotten unless it continues to be brought forward and I I think that what happened in inviting them all to the US I'm sure many of them had a a general recollection Mm -hmm. uh, of this but uh, to to be there and to have people who were witness uh, talk about what what it was like in person was was really Really emotional and really important. Um, John Lewis himself, I think, is a true American hero. I, I had the privilege of being on the same bus in the congressional delegation as Congressman Lewis. And as we got to the bridge, he took the microphone and talked about what it felt like when he knelt down to pray. And as soon as he did, the charge began. Um, quite an experience to listen to his voice uh, I will also tell you that when we were at Medgar Evers' home, he was asked if he wanted to say a few words, and he couldn't. And he took the microphone, and he choked up and said, I can't. This is the first time I've been back here since Medgar was killed. Wow. Yeah. Well, it's amazing to me how this following this cooperative world gets you into spaces like that. Well, and I should say, before we would move on to another subject, that um, cooperatives are very much involved in the civil rights movement. Right. Uh, and, in fact, you would know from the housing cooperatives in New York, a lot of folks from the New York City area that came down were were certainly people who were cooperators and, and part of the movement. Well, the host March uh, 63 was all created in a in a cooperative housing in New York, the whole that was the go. center. Yep, uh, I think it was Penn South, um, but yeah, the, the housing co-op played a big role in that. Uh, but I met Andy Young. I took, got a picture with him uh, mm-hmm. in Birmingham at one of the Federation meetings, and he's been one of my heroes uh, as John Lewis. And when he he stood up in Brown Chapel 
uh, at one point, he was a co-sponsor that year in the 49th anniversary of the of the of the Bloody Sunday. Uh, he stood up when he wasn't expected to, went to the podium and said, "There's a lot of preaching that's been going on here. I got something else I want to say. We need to get out there and build jobs. We need to build the economy of our communities. Let's just not preach to one another. We need action." <laughs> That's what co-ops are about, and we're going to take a break, and then we'll be right back, and we're going to talk about creating jobs as one of the things that co-ops do. It really does in a big way. The president of the ICA on the program say co-ops help people to come out of poverty with dignity. Mm-hmm. Okay, and that's one of the other reasons I like co-ops. That was Dane Pauline Green yeah, when she was president. She's great. We'll be right back. Please don't touch the dial. Everybody, this is Vernon Oaks, and the program is Everything Co-op. And Mr. Martin Lowry is our guest today. I should say Dr. Lowry uh, from my teaching days. But National Rural Electric Co-ops, they've been around a long time, too. And they got started because there were no e- electricity in rural America because the large corporations would not go out. It would cost too much money to string the lines all across all of this vast land. And so... They didn't. They didn't do it. So then individuals did it with government help. Okay. So that's what that started with. Right. In fact, um, I've traced it back further to um, Theodore Roosevelt, uh, who had the idea of looking at public power as a as a way of addressing the economy of rural America. There, there was a report done on the commission called the Commission on Country Life that President Roosevelt had had put together, and. Um, that commission included a gentleman by the name of Horace Plunkett, who was the father of the Irish cooperative movement, who Theodore Roosevelt knew personally when he was chief of police in New York. Plunkett would come to New York and, and then go west, and they both loved the west. So Plunkett gets out west, he starts a cattle ranch in the Powder River Basin, and he realizes there are no cooperatives. And farmers and ranchers are not going to make it, in his opinion, in the west of the, of the United States if they don't form cooperatives. And Roosevelt was right with him on it. So the Commission on Country Life gets written up, Plunkett being a member of that commission, along with Gifford Pinchot, uh, very famous in terms of his interest in land management and, and future governor of Pennsylvania. And Roosevelt's cover letter to the Congress says, I recommend that you implement these ideas using the cooperative model wherever possible, because mm. it's the best model known to mankind where people are willing to take uh, initi- self-initiative. It doesn't happen, but Pinchot gets to Pennsylvania as governor. He starts talking about public power and the fact that we need power to the people, so to speak. Okay. Now you get to Franklin Roosevelt. You still have a rural America without electricity, uh, for the most part. Uh, and he looks at it and says, in effect, my cousin was correct. My cousin Teddy was right that we need hydropower. And the best way to do this is to bring that hydropower to the people through cooperatives. But there is another hitch to the story, which is when the Rural Electrification Administration was created because of what you said, that the investor-owned utilities were unwilling to serve. They wouldn't take the money. They wouldn't take the federal government subsidy uh, to build out a line to rural America. And that's when the government itself had to say, well, how will we do this? Luckily, we had some advocates uh, in the administration who said, why don't we try the co-op model? Why don't we look at the idea of lending to a cooperative where we know those farmers and ranchers who are going to become the um, members. M- members are good on their word. Mm-hmm. Like we talked about earlier, the question of collateral. Mm-hmm. What's the collateral that we have here that keeps the federal government lending whole? It's the word of the, the people in rural America. And there have been very, very few defaults over the years. So that's how it, that's how it all got started. And now there are how many rural electric co-ops are? In round numbers, 900. Okay. That, that includes That's what I had in my head. Distribution too. cooperatives, generation transmission cooperatives, and, and related service organizations. So I was in a meeting at the NCBA CLUSA and a year or two ago, and I think it was the Rappahannock Co-op in Virginia that was talking about they put in solar power. Mm-hmm. And then they came back and put in broadband. Mm-hmm. And they were talking about how they created classes in um, 
to teach the, the students how to do the, both the solar and the broadband. And they got the, the whole school really involved both in knowledge. That's the fifth principle, uh, that we talked about. Uh, but, but t- providing the electricity, renewable electricity, providing the broadband and then teaching folks how to do it. That's a perfect example. And Rappahannock is a very progressive organization, even to the point that they are founders of the Transatlantic Electric Cooperative Alliance working in particular with Germany on looking at information sharing. So back to your principle of information, education, and communication. Uh, Kent Farmer as a CEO is uh, is very, very committed to that kind of outreach, both to cons- member consumers of the co-op as well as uh, the larger community. So the last time you were on a show, you talked about the struggles in Puerto Rico with rural electric co-op. How's that going? Well, the struggle is actually without rural electric co-ops. Um, we don't have any electric cooperatives in Puerto Rico. We have great credit unions, and we have a great um, cooperative um, community, if we, if we could put it that mm-hmm. way. Mm-hmm. Uh, lots of members of, of cooperatives in, in Puerto Rico. Um, the situation with the electric system is pretty much the same as when we talked last. Uh, yes, it's been reconstructed, but the Reconstruction was at a standard of quality that was pre-Hurricane Maria. And the argument was that FEMA couldn't reimburse for any upgrades to the systems. If you upgraded the system, somehow that's taxpayers paying for the upgrade as opposed to the utility paying for the upgrade. So there's still a lot of concern, particularly in the rural areas of Puerto Rico, about reliability and resiliency. And I will say that they were very, very lucky, unlike the Bahamas, um, that Dorian did not come straight through Puerto Rico. All right. Yeah, that would have been devastation. So still totally. quite a bit to do in terms of what models are going to work best to, to make for a re- resilient system that is also a renewable system. Um, it's a complicated issue to determine how you can take solar and storage and wind and, um, and also have resiliency at a Category 4 or Category 5 hurricane, something that uh, engineers are working on Around the clock, uh, including uh, NRECA uh, and its Business and Technology Strategies Group, working with Department of Energy, uh, Department of Defense, and others on on resiliency of systems, uh, including um, cybersecurity resiliency. So, is there is there room for a rural electric co-op in Puerto Rico? I've always thought there is. Um, it it fits a wonderful pattern in terms of w- what rural areas can accomplish if you have local control and ownership. Uh, we certainly saw that happen uh, in an island situation with Kauai. Uh, Kauai Island Utility Cooperative is now, it's been around since 2002. It was an acquisition from an investor-owned company, Citizens Communications out of Stanford, Connecticut. And with a lot of help, we were able to have a referendum among the citizenry to acquire the assets and create a co-op. And we had an interim board of directors that served as the purchaser, in effect. Mm-hmm. Cooperative Finance Corporation, our sister organization in Herndon, uh, provided bridge financing. And the federal government provided long-term financing because Kauai is primarily rural. And since then, they have gotten very serious about renewable energy. Uh, they held uh, listening meetings all around the island and concluded that the – incredibly interesting, diverse population in Kauai really wanted to be 100% renewable at some point in the future, and they've set a goal now of 2040. And they're about halfway there, working off of solar with uh, Tesla battery backup storage, other types of storage technology, uh, and hydro. And um, they're uh, really a model uh, for the world. So there is an opportunity to look at how island economies and cooperative ownership fit together quite well. For Puerto Rico now, kind of like I have to ask this question, Martin. I'm African American, you're European American, but in Hawaii, that it turns out that the old board, the people that were on the board of the old company, are they on the board of the new company? And how does that board look like now? So we worked very hard to make sure that the interim board of directors represented the diverse ethnicity of the island. And we actually went door-to-door asking people to volunteer to serve. 
these were all leaders on the island. For example, just to, off the top of my head, Peggy Cha, who was the chancellor of Kauai Community College. Freckles Smith, Hawaiian, who ran the um, Waialua River uh, cruise operations. Uh, so we, we looked at Japanese American, Filipino American, Chinese American, a native Hawaiian, Caucasian, men and women. There's actually Portuguese American as well, uh, a significant community. And that was the diversity on that original board, all of whom agreed to serve until an election could be done within 120 days after the purchase. So that election now is not one where you can say, okay, I need the following ethnicity as a member of the board. It's wide open. Mm -hmm. Uh, So you have the nomination election process, as all co-ops do. And I would say the diversity has held up extraordinarily well for these number of years. The elections are highly contested. And there's a very big voter turnout. So highly contested mean there's a lot of activity contested? Or? A lot of people running. Okay. Right? Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, okay. So it is a melting pot of Hawaii and that people are represented there on the board. So they're, it's for the people, by the people, run by the people there. No question. <laughs> okay. Yep. That's what I like co-ops. All right. Literally. Well, and, and that gives me an opportunity to talk about the co-op values. Earlier in the program, we talked about the ethical values, including caring for others and honesty and openness and so on. Yeah. The, the values that are really uniquely cooperative as opposed to the ethical values are self-help, self-responsibility, democracy, equity, equality, and solidarity. I would say Kauai Island Utility Cooperative represents every one of those. And if you're on an island in the middle of the Pacific, you better understand self-help and self-responsibility. <laughs> yeah. And right along with that, it turns out to be self-determination. They get to determine their their world, their life. And that was life. very, very important to them in the discussions about whether to go ahead and purchase the assets. It works when it works. It works really, 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 really well. Uh, and I like the, I think it's the third principle. They put some money in to be a member, and then if there are profits, then they get some dividends back or patronage back. That's the economic participation principle. That's correct. So, in effect, you never know exactly how much capital you're going to require on the capital side of the budget or what your operating expenses are going to be to the penny. Right. right. N- no, no organization does. So, at the end of the year, you reconcile that and you, and you look at what your margins have been. Those margins are all, in a cooperative, are all allocated to the patrons as patronage capital. They don't have to be retired. They can be used as working capital. But if the board of directors decides that that working capital need still allows for a certain amount of that patronage that's been allocated to be retired, it is. And so... Retired for, means it goes back to the members. That's, uh, that's right. Thank okay. you. That was All a little right. bit of a, too, of a technical <laughs> phrase there. <laughs> <Okay>. Retired. <laughs> yeah, it goes away. No, it goes back to the members uh, as an allocation. And uh, m- many, many electric cooperatives on an annual basis are doing that, uh, that uh, patronage return refund. So I like it when... When there there is profit or surplus, whatever you want to call it, what I've found heard on this program is there normally it goes into three buckets. One is that they save some for growth and capital needs. Uh, two is they give to the community, and that's a social responsibility, caring for others, looking at what the community needs. And the third is giving it back to dividends, and the board decides that. That's correct. Okay. That that is now. There's another angle on this for electric cooperatives. Most are following a program that's around for a number of years now called Operation Roundup. If you're willing to round your bill up to the next dollar, then that differential goes into a community fund, and there is a board that oversees that fund that is not the board of directors of the co-op, but it's individuals in the community who volunteer on that board, and then people bring their projects forward, uh, and that community board determines whether to fund the project. Operation Roundup. Operation Roundup, a hugely successful program. It's been going for 25, 30 years around the country. That is great. We're going to take our final break, Martin. I think we need another two hours because it's wonderful. But we'll we'll take our final break, and I guess we'll come back. Uh, you talked about the values, but I want to come back and talk about some of the mission of ICA. Sure, we'll come back. Great. All right. We'll be right back, everybody. Washington, D.C. 
Police News Talk, 1450 AM, WOF, 95.9 FM. Welcome back, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks, program with Everything Cooperative. We talked a little bit about Doran and hitting the Bahamas early on. And for anybody out there, um, CDF, Corporate Development Fund, Mark, will you, will you talk about quickly how people can give money for for the co-ops in Sure. In Bahamas? Sure. Well, there are, there are a lot of different ways, but if we want to do it specifically through the co-ops, there is a disaster recovery fund that the Cooperative Development Foundation put together a number of years ago. Uh, NRECA is very supportive of it and, uh, and a co-contributor on it. If you want to, the easiest way to get to that is Google CDF Bahamas, and it'll come right up on, on the um, disaster recovery fund. CDF is a wonderful organization uh, affiliated with uh, NCBA, CLUSA, and uh, they do a, a really good job of delivering uh, the right level of resources to cooperative organizations that really need it. And in a disaster recovery situation, that's where it's most needed. And for the Bahamas, as you can see from what we've looked at on television, it's uh, needed desperately. Yeah. So uh, after this program, I'm going and donate some money to that. It, it's horrible when you look at the death flattened the houses just farther you can see but what is the purpose what are some of the purpose of ICA International Cooperative Alliances well I had a bit of a discovery when I first came on to the to the ICA board I had a a, a great mentor over the years at NRECA by the name of Neil Doherty who um, ran our consulting and, and search activities for a number of years he would always say you've got to read the articles of incorporation and the bylaws not every co-op is the same. You ha- if you're going to be a good consultant, pick up the Articles of Incorporation, pick up the bylaws. So I picked up the bylaws and Articles of Incorporation of the International Cooperative Alliance, and I was stunned. Now, remember, this is 1895, the organization was created. Um, got support from all over the world. NCBA is very supportive, and we have a number of, uh, of other um, APEX organizations that are members. NRECA is a member. Land O'Lakes is a member. CDF is a member. CDH is a member. I misspoke there, not CDF, uh, CHS. So here's the purpose of the International Cooperative Alliance as written in the bylaws, Article 1, to promote the cooperative movement based on mutual self-help and democracy, to promote and protect cooperative values and principles, to facilitate the development of economic and other mutually beneficial relations between its member organizations, to promote sustainable human development and further the economic and social progress of people, thereby contributing to international peace and security. And finally, to promote equality between men and women in all decision-making and activities within the cooperative movement. Wow, 1895? Well, I'm sure that that evolved over the years, and they've been amended, and probably this, this was amended as of perhaps 1995 or 2000. Um, I I find it very persuasive, and um, I've been involved as the chair of the drafting group for the 2020 to 2030 strategic plan for the International Cooperative Alliance, and I wanted to make sure that it was directly incorporated into that planning document, which will be discussed in our General Assembly in Kigali, Rwanda in October. So it's the beginning of trying to disseminate information that's already out there. It's already in print, but many people would say, oh, bylaws, I don't need to read the bylaws. Right. Right, I find that property management, you, the bylaws is the first thing you go to when you start managing. But I, this is just curious. In, in a couple of places, this, this, so you want to promote equality between men and women in all decision making and activities within the cooperative movement. That hasn't happened yet. <laughs> uh, this is true. Uh, it, it's true. Um, I think. In many ways and in many cultures, we still are a male-dominated uh, movement. But just as the U.S. Congress is looking to uh, how, how can the House of Representatives go from 22 percent women to 50 percent or 51 percent women, we, we need to very much concentrate on that. There is a gender equality committee of the ICA board, and that gender equality committee meets not only 
with the board itself, but they meet regionally. So there are four regions of the ICA. There's Asia Pacific, Africa, Europe, and the Americas. And the Americas, North America, and Latin America. Um, Gender equality committees exist in each of those regions as well. And as you can well imagine, the discussion around gender equality is going to be very dependent upon cultural mores within a country and, and then in a mixed way within an entire region. But it is... It is a top priority for the 2020 to 2030 plan. The, interestingly, the ethnic and racial diversity is in many ways a non-issue at the international level because you're already dealing with all ethnicities and races in, in the global movement. It's, it's much more of an issue uh, regarding women and youth because in either women or youth uh, discussions, You've already got a great cross-section of ethnicity and race. But I find here in the U.S. that still for African Americans, it's not as much, not as many African Americans are on these boards as their representative in communities. But I'm also finding that uh, I think at Workers Co-ops, it said that 40 percent. 40, 45 percent of the new worker co-ops are people of color. Yes. OK. And I, I, that that's great because I, I really believe and one of the reasons I love it is one of the ways of creating financial and social wealth mm-hmm. for anybody that's in a moderate because it's not just African-Americans that are are in low income communities. Growing up in West Virginia, I know it's a lot of whites that are po- <laughs> poor. <laughs> okay, so it's like, how do you move folks from poverty to wealth? And this is where I find co-ops can do that, can do it well. This is an interesting subject globally, uh, not just income inequality, but as you said, wealth inequality. And and the statistics are very clear. And if we even just focused on the U.S., the wealth inequality as a racial divide is enormous. It's mm-hmm. absolutely enormous. And that has to do with savings, net worth, uh, ownership, mm-hmm. uh, property ownership. Mm-hmm. You know that mm-hmm. better mm-hmm. than I. Mm-hmm. It, it, it's got to be addressed. And, and unfortunately, the, the inequality discussion more often limits itself only to income inequality. And, and we, we have to begin to address wealth inequality, so especially since we know the statistics so well in terms of the, the, the 1% that uh, basically control the majority of wealth in the world. Well, this this wealth inequality, is, and I've been trying to, even at my church, uh, but but everywhere, is the balance sheet is more important than the profit and loss statement. The profit and loss statement on day-to-day, right now, yes, did I make money or did I lose money? you got to know that. But are you creating on a balance sheet? What's your assets what, look like? Yeah. Are what's they your growing? Equity? Yeah. Yeah. You know, what's your net worth? What's your equity? How many, what kind of assets do you have? Mm-hmm. Is that going up or down and so forth? And when you have things like uh, Dorian and Maria or you have the 06, 07, 08 uh, recession, that all takes away the wealth. It takes away the wealth in a huge kind of way because it wasn't there right. after slavery and everything that, that blacks have been through in the U.S. So this creating wealth that has not been there. And then what little wealth is normally in real estate or housing, and that goes away or it gets squashed because a lot of people, even in Louisiana, they didn't have insurance. They didn't, but particularly in flood areas, they just, they got wiped out, just total. Right. So, uh, yeah, this whole wealth inequality is a big big issue worldwide not just in the u.s but worldwide and if we don't address it i mean that that turns to be one of the reasons they talk about uh world wars and upsets and all of this is when this 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 if it keeps going the way it's going because the one percenters are getting something like i don't know if it was 57 or 60 percent 67 percent of every new dollar so every new dollar goes to the, the, the wealthy, and then those fifty percent or below are not getting this wealth. And how do you get that? Change it around. The only way I see changing around is through co-ops. It may be a way you can do it politically, but I don't see politicians saying that, that look at the tax law that just passed. It gives more and more wealth to those one percenters, not to the everyday people. I think that this argument uh, is correct, but I think we have to have a caveat on it, which involves the. Uh, accusation that basically you're just talking about radical socialism. And I think that we have to be looking at at cooperatives as a different way of thinking about wealth um, acquisition. Because if you look at some South American countries, they would say basically 
that's what we do. We we redistribute income, and mm-hmm. that's not not the right way to think about it. That's not what I'm talking about either. I know, yeah, I'm, I'm talking about. The I know. Way I just talking about it was a caveat for for all of us. Okay, so we only have another minute, and you had talked about economic development is where you see us going, and this fits into this. Inequality. Oh, we, we, we have to look at cooperatives as economic development engines, which they've always been and always will be. A great conference coming up in Kigali, Rwanda in October on uh, cooperative development. First time the International Cooperative Alliance has taken on the subject of cooperative development, amazingly enough. Wow. First time. So it's a, it's a great start, and um, certainly NCBA is there and recognizes it. The ICA is getting there now. We could, we could see a whole global conversation on this subject, and it's, it's desperately needed. What would you like to leave people with? Believe. Believe, believe. in co-ops. They're, they're the right way to think about the future. And with all the divisiveness we've got today, we have a story to tell. We have a value proposition to offer. And we need to do that together in solidarity. So believe also come out to the Co-op Impact Conference. Co-op is, Impact Conference, first week of October. Yep. And it's going to be over Sheraton in Alexandria. Alexandria. And right. you can get more and more information about this. Go yep. to ncba.coop. And if you're adventurous, check out the Kigali Rwanda Cooperatives for Development Conference. It'll take place uh, October 14th to 17th in Rwanda. And this next week, please live cooperatively. We'll see you next Thursday.